I've mentioned it before that this show is Patreon supported, and the top tier of Patreon support is you buy a show, you call the topic of the show. And the person who did that this week is a longtime viewer, and he asked me to talk about game enhancement devices. If this were a different show, there'd be a skit here about a little blue pill, but I'm not that interesting. With a title like that, it's almost screaming for that skit, but I'm not going to do it. Not the show style. <clears throat> Something that seems to be a constant is that game developers can't... Well, okay, I could argue that any form of media can't leave anything well enough alone. I mean, let's look at movies. At first, they were silent movies, then they made talkies, then they had color, then panoramic color, and each step made movies cooler. Then there's the stuff that, um... Yeah, black and white 3D scratch and sniff cards, so-called Hypno Vista, 4D... And I'd make a joke about, let's make it in 4D, but that's actually become a thing. Theaters have been specifically modified with wind and water effects and rumble seats and everything. So, what's better than a crappy movie? A crappy movie with motion sickness. Now, on one hand, it's kind of cool. I mean, I've seen a couple of these 4D films myself, and they're okay, I guess. But on the other hand, it gets to be a little much pretty fast. And it's not just movies that do this, and here's where we start to enter our wheelhouse here. Video games do it too. When you look at the history of video games, it is littered with peripherals that somehow got greenlit and hit the market. The Atari 2600 had a couple, like the Joy Board, and then there was this one called the Mind Link, and that never really took off, and I'm not sure if I'm happy or sad about that. Then in television, they had this voice emulator that made B-17 Bomber an internet punchline. Or how about the original NES that had tons of peripherals? A later bundle pack came with a NES, a light zapper, and a floor pad with a cartridge that you could use all three of them with. Okay, then there's the other things like the Power Glove, the U-Force, various alternate controllers, and... Rob. Maybe I should mention that Sega had a robot design too, but it was mostly meant for just arcade... Okay, but uh, I digress. The, the funny thing is that, you know, I had a friend who owned a Power Glove, and I had another friend who owned Rob, and I had a couple other friends had some of those weird controllers, but they just sat and collected dust. They went unused because of reasons that most of you are now familiar with, but at the time it was like, hey cool, a robot! At best, Rob was just unwieldy for gaming, and at worst, it just didn't work out that well. And for other gimmicks like the Power Glove... Yeah, I think I can just safely say, it's so bad. All these gimmicks on all these other peripheral devices never managed to replace this. So, all these things went out of style with the old style consoles, right? Yeah, not really. You know, the PS3 had some goofy ones, like the PlayStation Move, that comes to mind. And they just took the Wii gimmick and put it on a real console. Oh! I suppose I could also argue that the Wii is a gimmick system, using mostly motion control and that, that stupid silly balance thing. Wait, why does that balance board look familiar? Oh, yeah. But I, I know my friends play Super Smash Bros. using Amiibos and these specialty controllers. Wait 20 years, this is going to be hilarious. Then there's the cameras that came on the last-gen consoles, like the Kinect and the PSI. Uh, PS4 and Xbox had cameras too, and they wanted to spy on us 24-7-3 six... Okay, 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 I'm backing away, I'm backing away. And the thing is that most of these peripherals just fall flat on their faces. Well, why? It's because these things are not designed for the real world. I want to focus on the Kinect, because I think this is the one thing that most people can relate to. When you look at ads for it, what do you notice? Big, spacious, TV, sitcom, living room, professional lighting. I seriously believe this is what they think we all live like, but reality for most people I know, we live in apartments. We have living rooms that has stuff in it. So what that means is that the Kinect is pretty much useless. We just don't have 10 feet of space between the TV and the back wall. And if you could somehow find that butter zone between calf scraping the couch and too close to the detect, the damn thing couldn't handle the backlighting if the lights are in the wrong spot, so now you gotta lug those around too. This is all assuming that the thing even worked. Now, the camera is acceptable, but anyone in the background, anybody talking, and sometimes just any movement the game isn't familiar with, and the game yells at you. In fact, most of the game peripherals that are available, they sound great until you try it in the real world. You know, I don't know anybody who could get a Sega activator ring to work reliably. The U-Force just flat out didn't work, and neither did the power pad. The Zapper? Okay, that worked. But if you have an LCD TV, no, it doesn't work anymore. But at the time, okay, yeah, it worked but not many others did. So yeah, this thing wasn't really designed with the real world in mind. I mean, if you live on a soundstage, fantastic, have fun. But like the rest of us, if you live in a place where you have to go outside to change your mind, yeah, not so much. 
The second thing is that these become the gaming equivalent of this. Mono tools. I can kind of explain this by asking a quick question. Do you wear a watch? I'm going to bet no. But I'm willing to bet you that right now, somewhere nearby, you have a phone, and it has a clock, a GPS, a camera, a media player, social media connections, and oh yeah, you can call people on it too. You know, it's a modern world. We like our multi-tools, not mono-tools. A mono-tool is very good at one specialized thing, but outside of that one special application, it's pretty much useless. And this describes most game peripherals. Let's take a look at Rob. It had two games. The Nest Powerpad had 11 games, being generous. The Zapper had 16 officially licensed games, and even then it was optional in some of those. Each gadget for a game is basically a mono tool. You need it to play that one single game, and then it gets put in the shoebox and forgotten about. Of interest, this kind of thing is cropping up again, but not really. I mean, I'm, I'm looking at the Pip-Boy edition of Fallout 4. Now, you don't need the Pip-Boy wrist container to use the smartphone app, which is kind of nice. So the question is whether or not you're going to need the smartphone app to play. Well, I actually found only one site that said it's not necessary, but this could be the direction that things go. Although, I hope it doesn't really go that way, because it would really start to separate the haves and have-nots in the gaming world. Oh, well, you can't afford to have a top-end smartphone on top of the console you just bought? Well, tough luck, you can't play our games. Although, it would go a long way to solve the monotool problem between kids being bankrolled by their parents, but... Oh yeah, monotools. Um, yeah, so what is this thing? This is a pineapple core. Mono tool. Microsoft actually tried to curb this problem with the Kinect. Now, nobody's actually saying it outright, but after reading a lot of articles about it, the universal thought is either they bribed or forced companies through contracts to make Kinect compatible games to make its launch successful. Kind of a, see, there's tons of games for the Kinect. Go buy one. The problem was is that the Kinect compatibility was like every other gaming bandwagon thing. It didn't feel tacked on as much as it was kind of attached to the game with masking tape. Motion controls were a joke, and people would just Kermit flail their arms around to make things happen on the screen. The Kinect got a bad reputation because the games were just a joke, and its reputation is not going away anytime soon. Add to that, when the X-Bone announced that it could be sold without the camera, companies are hedging even more to make content for the hardware. I mean, there's no guarantee that everybody has this camera, so consumers aren't going to buy all the camera games. Essentially, it returned to the Kinect to the monotool category, and frankly, players hated it after its disastrous launch. The basic way that I see it is that when we're playing a game, we don't want to have to fight the UI, and we don't have to want to fight the interface system so the computer can understand what we're trying to do. We just want to play the game. We're 30 years in, and nobody's found a good way to replace a simple, basic controller. Now, of course, that said, why did this work? Yeah, the Guitar Hero controller is a mono tool, but it's a wildly successful mono tool. And they did oversaturate the market with titles, but it's still a successful game. So what did they do right? To get into why I think the way I do, you gotta look at how these games are mostly played. And for the most part, it's a party game. It's not unlike Mario Kart or Mario Party in that way. You can play them alone, sure, but most of the time when I see people playing them, it's in a social setting. The game is basically a carrier for interaction that can be scaled to player experience. The person playing expert drums is doing just as well as the person on beginner guitar, and everyone's having a good time. There are a lot of games you just can't play in a social setting, especially with non-gamers. Any split-screen, four-player game, yeah, that's not fun if you don't know what you're doing. Super Smash Bros. loses its novelty for non-gamers when they get demolished for the fifth time in a minute, but Guitar Hero? Well, just strap on a guitar and pretend to be a rock star. And there's value in that novelty of gaming without gaming. Novelty. That's what it comes down to. It's these companies trying to sell you products by saying, well, you've never done this before. Mm, yeah, and there's always going to be a market for people who want to be the first ones to beat or conquer something, but novelty kind of wears off when it's always there. And, you know, without a sense of occasion going along with it, the novelty just kind of falls flat. I think this is actually the saddest part of the death of arcade gaming. Okay, yeah, arcades are still out there, but it's not like it was back in the heyday. I mean, the cabinets themselves were gimmicky because they had to be to compete for attention in this arcade setting. Games had guns sitting on them, and they had cool joysticks and spinners, and some cabinets had practical effects built in, like the Qbert Knocker Journey's tape deck. Yeah, the 80s band Journey had a video game. Another time, but... 
And, and this isn't counting specific game locations like Battletech Center or Virtuality or games that couldn't exist in your home like Galaxian 3. Stuff like this were the norm because the novelty worked. Since you weren't playing all the time, it was fresh and new every time you played it. Not to mention practicality, I mean, you can't make a 4D theater in your home. You probably don't have room for that Virtuality rig or that arcade cabinet. So going to a place that has it makes the occasion memorable and not mundane. Even then, the novelty wears down unless the activity can adapt somehow. Which leads us to the future. Personally, I don't think that game kitsch like this is going to be going anywhere anytime soon. I mean, this year it's Amiibos, next year it might be Oculus Rift controllers, and then the year, like 10 years from now, it might be, I don't know, 4D gaming chairs with rumble seats and wind and water effects and other stuff that they figure out how to make affordable and put in your living room space. There's always going to be a market for firsties. And really, that's what most of this is. You got game companies just cashing in on the hardcore crowd who want to live life on the edge of technology and have to have the latest game accessory first. Or selling collectibles that actually do something. Or people who look at ads and say, that is awesome and I need one, regardless of if it works or not. Or people who think they can get an advantage by buying the latest gimmick. If you can figure this thing out, you're way ahead of me. But in the end, I think we'll keep coming back to what works. Basic controller, basic screen, and basically good games. But I don't think that the innovation should end. People used to think two buttons were enough. That all said, I think that companies should keep on pushing forward with technology, but they should keep the real world in mind. We are over 30 years into this whole gaming thing, and we have yet to really replace the basic controller, because it's reliable and it's universal. And those things never really go out of style. Seriously, what the heck were we thinking? Just for the record, I'm not that short, it's just that this phone is comically large.